We begin the exploration of international economics, so named based on the combination of many independent economies in the form of international trade. Really, in today's world of interconnected commerce, there are no truly independent economies. We are all interconnected through our systems of banking, commerce, trade, and socioeconomic ties. I'm an American citizen with a wife and daughters who were born in the Soviet Union. My wife's grandparents came from Scandinavia, but her mother was born in Michigan, USA. We talk weekly with my wife's sister in Finland, using Skype. Those interconnected linkages of people in many countries are reflected through international economies and degrees of economic openness. McDonald's is a multinational corporation in monopolistically competitive marketplaces where they strive to differentiate their products from their competition. If McDonald's sells a hamburger in Japan, it collects Japanese yen for that burger. The company next has to exchange the yen for dollars when it brings those proceeds back to the United States. If the dollar gains in value against the yen, then McDonald's exchanges the currency it takes a hit on that revenue it earned from the sale of the hamburger. Because the dollar appreciated against the yen, it now takes more yen to equal one dollar than it did before. This is an important component of McDonald's business and an important consideration for McDonald's investors. For fiscal year 2015, more than 75% of McDonald's revenue came from outside the United States. Most growth going forward is expected to come from business expansion overseas rather than from within the United States. Foreign currency exchange is therefore an important factor for shareholders to bear in mind. Over the course of 2015, the dollar increased in value against most world currencies. Indeed, much of Europe and Asia currently view the United States economy as the engine of growth for the global economy. The U.S. market is so large, strong, driven by consumption, and partial to imports that can boost production in European and Asian nations. That's a large responsibility, and one that Americans, by virtue of their free-spending ways, unwittingly but willingly take on. Likewise, when the U.S. business cycle turns down and demand decreases, no one in Europe or Asia is happy about it. Of course, economic policies and behavior in Europe and Asia are larger determinants of their economic fate. So, it would be going too far to say, when the U.S. sneezes, Asia and Europe catches cold. But there is a grain of truth in that. Nearly all economies are open economies. An open economy is an economy that has interactions in trade or finance with other countries. A closed economy is an economy that has no interactions in trade or finance with other countries. A good way to understand the interactions between one economy and other economies is through the balance of payments, which is the record of a country's trade with other countries in goods, services, and assets. The balance of payments contains three accounts, the current account, the financial account, and the capital account. The current account is the part of the balance of payments that records a country's net exports, net income on investments, and net transfers. Any payments received by U.S. residents are positive numbers in the current account, and any payments made by U.S. residents are negative numbers in the current account. The financial account is the part of the balance of payments that records purchases of assets a country has made abroad and foreign purchases of assets in the country. The financial account records long-term flows of funds into and out of a country. There is a capital outflow from the United States when an investor in the United States buys a bond issued by a foreign company or government or when a U.S. firm builds a factory in another country. There is capital inflow into the United States when the foreign investor buys a bond issued by a U.S. firm or by the government or when a foreign firm 
builds a factory in the United States. When firms build or buy facilities in foreign countries, they are engaging in foreign direct investment. When investors buy stocks or bonds issued in another country, they are engaging in foreign portfolio investment. Net capital flows are the difference between capital inflows and capital outflows. The sum of the current account balance, financial account balance, and the capital account balance equals the balance of payments. The balance of payments is always zero. To make the balance on the current account equal the balance on the financial account, the balance of payments includes an entry called the statistical discrepancy. Changes in foreign holdings of dollars are known as official reserve transactions. Foreign investment in the United States and additions to foreign holdings of dollars both show up as positive entries in the U.S. financial account. Therefore, a current account deficit must be exactly offset by a financial account surplus, leaving the balance of payments equal to zero. The balance of trade is the difference between the value of the goods a country exports and the value of goods a country imports. If a country exports more than it imports, it has a trade surplus. If a country exports less than it imports, then it has the trade deficit. Notice the balance of exports and imports in 2012. Only Latin America countries, excluding Mexico, represent regions where the USA had a net export position. Everywhere else represents locations where we buy more products from than we sell to. Looking at the picture from Japan's viewpoint, notice how Japan exports more only to the USA and Asian countries, excluding China. Net exports are a component of each country's aggregate expenditure. We can calculate net exports by adding together the balance of trade and the balance of services. The balance of services is the difference between the value of the services a country exports and the value of services a country imports. The current account balance is responsive to business cycles, recessions or expansions in one country and in many countries simultaneously, as trade arrangements influence the flow of capital. Equally influential are currency exchange rates. The terms of trade articulate how countries focus their energies to make sales of certain goods and services expand through trade between countries. One country does not always need to win the trade exchange competition. In fact, international expansion helps in a sustainable manner when everyone gains based on their comparative advantages. I want my nearest trading partner to be as successful as I am so we can continue mutually beneficial trade. A financial account is part of a country's balance of payments that covers claims on or liabilities against non-residents financial assets. Financial account components include direct investment, portfolio investment, and reserve assets. Net foreign investment is the difference between capital outflows from a country and capital inflows, also equal to net foreign direct investment plus net foreign portfolio investment. When net capital flows are positive, net foreign investment is negative. When net capital flows are negative, net foreign investment is positive. The capital account is part of the balance of payments that records relatively minor transactions, such as migrants transfers and sales and purchases of non-produced, non-financial assets. Prior to 1999, The capital account recorded all of the transactions now included in both the financial account and the capital account. A multinational corporation may sell its products in many different countries and receive payments in many different currencies. The nominal exchange rate is the value of one country's currency in terms of another country's currency on the date of the transaction. The real exchange rate corrects the nominal exchange rate for changes in prices of goods and services between countries. The market exchange rate is determined by the interaction 
of demand and supply. There are three sources of foreign currency demand for the U.S. dollar. First, foreign firms and households that want to buy goods and services produced in the USA. Two, foreign firms and households that want to invest in the United States, either through foreign direct investment or through foreign portfolio investment. Third, currency traders who believe that the value of the dollar in the future will be greater than its value today. The demand curve for dollars in exchange for a foreign currency has the normal downward slope, while the supply curve has the normal upward slope. Equilibrium occurs in the foreign exchange market where the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded. Surpluses and shortages in the foreign exchange market are eliminated quickly because the volume of trading in major currencies, such as the dollar and the yen, is very large, and currency traders are linked together by computer. Currency appreciation is an increase in the market value of one currency relative to another currency. Currency depreciation is a decrease in the market value of one currency relative to another currency. Currencies appreciate against each other for various reasons, including government policy, interest rates, trade balances, and business cycles. Currencies are quoted and traded in pairs. Unlike a stock, of which the price represents its value, a currency quote is the rate at which one currency is exchanged for another. A strong dollar, one that can purchase more foreign currency relative to a weak dollar, means that U.S. consumers pay less for imports. It also means that foreign consumers must pay more for U.S. exports. A weak dollar, one that can purchase less foreign currency relative to a strong dollar, means that U.S. consumers must pay more for imports from foreign nations. However, foreign consumers will pay less for U.S. goods and services, which will help increase production and employment in America. So, the strong dollar and the weak dollar each have positive and negative effects. Think about it. A strong dollar helps U.S. consumers because it makes foreign goods, which American consumers clearly enjoy buying, cheaper. Yet, it hurts U.S. exports and therefore U.S. production and employment. It also makes the United States a less affordable travel destination for foreign visitors. Meanwhile, a weak dollar makes U.S. exports and travel in the United States more affordable for foreigners. That helps U.S. production and employment. However, it also rises the price of imports for Americans. This, in a sense, limits U.S. consumers' choices and can contribute to inflation. But it shifts buying behavior in favor of U.S. products, which also helps U.S. employment. The best dollar policy is, therefore, one that balances the pros and cons of a strong and weak dollar, and that takes the economies of our trading partners into account. That last point can be important. A dollar that is strong against the euro, for example, will weaken the euro. EU products will become more affordable to Americans, and Americans will be encouraged to travel to Europe. That can help EU nations struggling with recession and unemployment. All of our economies are linked. Some currencies have fixed exchange rates that do not change over long periods. A country's central bank must intervene in the foreign exchange market to buy and sell its currency to keep the exchange rate fixed. A fixed exchange rate is a country's exchange rate regime under which the government or central bank ties the official exchange rate to another country's currency or to the price of gold. The purpose of a fixed exchange rate system is to maintain a country's currency value within a very narrow band. Most major industrialized nations have maintained floating exchange rate systems since the early 1970s while some developing economies continue to have fixed-rate systems. China embraced the fixed exchange rate from about 1995 through 2005. The yuan renminbi is again based on a market valuation system responsive to their position in global trade arrangements, making China the world's largest exporter of goods. Three main factors cause the demand and supply curves in the foreign exchange market to shift. One, demand changes for foreign versus domestically produced goods and services. 
Two, investment venue shifts between domestic and foreign countries. Third, cross-currency value expectations into the short-term and long-term horizons. Think of money as a commodity. We buy and sell currencies to enable the purchase of foreign goods and to make foreign investments. Each time we convert our home currency to another currency, we are increasing the supply of the U.S. dollar. Supply shifts to the right. As U.S. consumers' incomes increase because of expansion business cycles and favorable investment gains, interest rates in the USA climb, making U.S. government borrowing of T-bills more attractive to foreign investors. The demand for U.S. dollars increases. The U.S. dollar demand shifts to the right. The new equilibrium, point B, is found where the quantity of dollars traded has increased with the exchange rate requiring more Japanese yen needed in exchange for each U.S. dollar. Predicting exactly where this new equilibrium will be met is challenging, at best, but it is where currency speculators are found. Speculators are buyers and sellers in the foreign exchange market who are currency traders buying and selling foreign currencies in an attempt to profit from changes in exchange rates. The demand curve for dollars shifts to the right when incomes in a foreign country rise, when interest rates in the U.S. rise, or when speculators decide that the value of the dollar will rise relative to the value of the foreign currency. The factors affecting the supply curve for dollars are similar to those that affect the demand curve for dollars. A recession in the United States will decrease the demand for a foreign country's products and cause the supply curve for dollars to shift to the left. A decrease in the interest rates in a foreign country will make financial investments in that foreign country less attractive and cause the supply curve for dollars to shift to the left. Whether the exchange rate increases or decreases depends on the direction of and size of the shifts in the demand curve and supply curve. Inconsistency in global currency markets is the reality of speculators and business people around the world. It becomes especially challenging when someone considers geopolitical interactions between two trading partners in respect to the rest of global trade interactions. Just 50 kilometers from the Russian border, Finland's Hamina Kotka port is one of the most important transshipment centers for goods to and from Russia. Tommy Sievers is the port's sales and marketing manager. Right now he's worried about the crisis in Ukraine, which is causing a trade crisis with neighboring Russia. Until recently, one in every five containers leaving this port was bound for Russia. Tommy Sievers was counting on Russian trade to keep growing. Was that the wrong strategy? No, I think it's it's very big opp- opportunity to us, and and our main volumes are still the Finnish exports, but but uh, the growth what we are looking for it's it's coming from the Russian business. Ships from Germany dock at this key, but here too they're feeling the effects of declining trade with Russia. Sales director Kako Sorella says this is partly due to EU sanctions. Russian banks are finding it hard to borrow money, and the ruble's value has plummeted, making imported goods pricier. Recognizing these challenges is relatively easy, unless it has not yet happened. Predicting the future can be most problematic, especially when it involves money. Consider, for example, Japan's largest trading partner is China in terms of goods imported at $160.7 billion in 2015, while at the same time, Japan imported only $66.6 billion of goods from the USA. Japan exports slightly more to the USA, $125.9 billion, in contrast to exports to China at $109.3 billion. While looking through this menu of Japan's trading partners, recognize these top 15 partners represent roughly 75% of Japan's total trade in goods. Also recognize 
Japan's balance of trade as being negative. Japan imports more than they export. The USA is not singular in that situation, as many other developed and growing nations share this trade deficit characteristic. Obviously, US dollar trades for Japanese yen are only part of the equilibrium sought in international currency markets. A depreciation of the domestic currency will increase exports and decrease imports, thereby increasing net exports. An appreciation of the domestic currency will have the opposite effect. Exports should fall and imports should rise, which will reduce net exports, aggregate demand, and real GDP. Continuously anchoring global prices to home currency fluctuations can be most problematic for multinational companies. Very often, companies attempt to develop foreign markets by creating linkages to the local populations and norms, including price setting. iPhone prices in foreign countries, like France, can increase and decrease irrespective of local costs, instead being pushed up or down because of currency exchange shocks. Currency appreciation decreases exports, while increasing imports at least in the short term. Eventually, the U.S. position will slow in respect to France because we are buying more of their superior wine and they are buying fewer of our loftier iPhones. Equilibrium will settle. The relative prices of two countries' goods are determined by two factors. The relative prices in the two countries and the nominal exchange rate between the two countries' currencies. Economists combine these two factors in the real exchange rate, which is the price of domestic goods in terms of foreign goods. We can calculate the real exchange rate between two currencies this way. Real exchange rate is equal to the nominal exchange rate times the domestic price level divided by the foreign price level. Real exchange rates are reported as index numbers, with one year chosen as a base year. The main value of the real exchange rate is in tracking changes through time. In this case, changes in the relative price levels of domestic goods in terms of foreign goods. The real exchange rate, called the RER, compares the relative price of two countries' consumption baskets. You may be interested in getting more information than the relative price of two currencies, or the nominal exchange rate. For example, you may want to know what $1 can buy in the Eurozone countries or what one euro can buy in the United States. In this case, you're interested in the RER. Now, it's been a year without Italian Parmesan or Spanish jamón for Russia. Uh, last August, Moscow banned certain EU and US food imports. Now, it came in response to economic sanctions applied by the West over Russia's alleged involvement in the Ukrainian crisis. Cheeses, fish, meat and also fruit and vegetables are all banned. The food embargo has now been prolonged for another year, with customs officials ordered to destroy any produce seized at the border. When a country imports more than it exports, the country must finance the difference by selling assets or by borrowing. When a country sells more assets to foreigners than it buys from foreigners, or when it borrows more from foreigners than it lends to foreigners, the country experiences a net capital inflow and a financial account surplus. When imports are greater than exports, net exports are negative, and there will be net capital inflow as people in the United States sell assets and borrow to pay for the excess of imports over exports. Therefore, net capital flows will be equal to net exports but with the opposite sign. And net foreign investment will also be equal to net exports, and with the same sign. These equations tell us that countries importing more than they export must borrow more from abroad than they lend abroad. If net exports are negative, net foreign investment will also be negative, and by the same amount. The total saving in any economy is equal to saving by the private sector plus saving by the government sector, called public saving. When the government runs a budget surplus by spending less than it receives in taxes, 
it is saving. When the government runs a budget deficit, public saving is negative. We can now write the saving and investment equation, an equation that shows that national saving is equal to domestic investment plus net foreign investment. It's written as national savings equals domestic investment plus net foreign investment, or S equals I plus NFI. This equation is an identity because it must always be true, given the definitions we used. The saving and investment equation tells us that a country's saving will be invested either domestically or overseas. A country such as the United States that has a negative net foreign investment must be saving less than it is investing domestically. When the government runs a budget deficit, national saving will decline unless private saving increases by the amount of the budget deficit, which is really unlikely. As the saving and investment equation shows, the result of a decline in national saving must be a decline in either domestic investment or net foreign investment. If the federal government runs a budget deficit, the U.S. Treasury must raise an amount equal to the deficit by selling bonds. To attract investors, the U.S. Treasury may have to raise the interest rates on its bonds. As interest rates on Treasury bonds rise, other interest rates, including those on corporate bonds and bank loans, will also rise. Higher interest rates will discourage some firms from borrowing funds to build new factories or to buy new equipment. Higher interest rates on financial assets in the United States will attract foreign investors who will buy U.S. dollars in order to purchase bonds from the United States. The greater demand for dollars will increase their value relative to other currencies. Exports from the United States will fall, and imports to the United States will rise. Net exports and net foreign investment will fall. When a government budget deficit leads to a decline in net exports, the result is sometimes referred to as the twin deficits, which refers to the possibility that a government budget deficit will also lead to a current account deficit. The twin deficits idea first became widely discussed in the United States during the early 1980s, when the federal government ran a large budget deficit that resulted in high interest rates, a high exchange value for the dollar, and a large current account deficit. The experience of the United States and other countries shows only mixed support for the twin deficits idea. The saving and investment equation shows that an increase in the government budget deficit will not lead to a current account deficit, provided that either the private saving increases or domestic investment declines. The United States is sometimes called the world's largest debtor nation, because since the 1980s, the large net capital flows into the United States resulting from the large U.S. current account deficits have resulted in foreign investors owning, as part of the end of 2012, about $3.9 trillion more of U.S. assets, such as stocks, bonds, and factories, than U.S. investors own of foreign assets. Economists refer to the ways in which monetary and fiscal policy affect the domestic economy as policy channels. An open economy has more policy channels than does a closed economy. When the Federal Reserve engages in an expansionary monetary policy, it buys U.S. Treasury securities to lower interest rates and stimulate aggregate demand. In a closed economy, the main effect of lower interest rates is on domestic investment spending and consumer durables. In an open economy, lower interest rates will also affect the exchange rate between the dollar and foreign currencies. Lower interest rates will cause some investors in the United States and abroad to switch from investing in U.S. financial assets to investing in foreign financial assets. This switch will cause the dollar to depreciate and net exports to increase. This additional policy channel will increase the ability of an expansionary monetary policy to affect 
aggregate demand. To engage in an expansionary fiscal policy, the federal government increases its purchases or cuts taxes. Increases in government purchases directly increase aggregate demand. Tax cuts increase aggregate demand by increasing household disposable income and business income. An expansionary fiscal policy may result in higher interest rates. In a closed economy, the main effect of higher interest rates is to reduce investment spending and purchases of consumer durables. In an open economy, higher interest rates will lead to an increase in the foreign exchange value of the dollar and a decrease in net exports. Therefore, in an open economy, an expansionary fiscal policy may be less effective because the crowding out effect may be larger. In a closed economy, only consumption and investment are crowded out by an expansionary fiscal policy. In an open economy, net exports may also be crowded out. A contractionary fiscal policy cuts government purchases or raises taxes to reduce household income and consumption. Contractionary fiscal policy also reduces the federal budget deficit, or increases the surplus, which may lower interest rates. Lower rates increase domestic investment and purchases of consumer durables. In an open economy, lower interest rates will also reduce the foreign exchange rate of the dollar and increase net exports. In an open economy, a contractionary fiscal policy will have a smaller effect on aggregate demand that will be less effective in slowing down an economy. Fiscal policy has a smaller effect on aggregate demand in an open economy than it does in a closed economy. Consider the topics of this discussion as it meanders through the stream of many countries and many economies to realize how interactions between these entities is realized. Many folks confuse the ideas of linked currencies and open borders. I stress to you the idea of making international trade a win-win situation, where all trading partners can benefit through international commerce. These ideas are rooted in economic freedom and profitable commerce.